and there we go. Greetings, once again, it's one more voice. Finally got the camera working. I know, uh, working is a bit of a stretch. Anyways, so, living out of a hotel room again, but let's go ahead and move on. So, something, uh, something again a little late to the party, but am I late to the party this time? Because it seems as if these people are not going away. The Antifa crowd. Now, I'm going to talk about them, going to do a brief little overview, because odds are most of you know exactly who they are if you click on this video. And I'm going to go ahead and point something out that I've noticed, and what, uh, what counter-protesters seem to have noticed. So, Antifa stands for anti-fascist, which is a bit of a strange, strange label, uh, you know, considering their, considering their activities. But then again, the glorious Democratic People's Republic of North Korea doesn't exactly follow the model of its name either. So, something I've noticed about Antifa from watching a couple of videos like of counter-protesters and the Antifa people clashing, because, you know, you have every now and again, every now and again these people run into people that have differing opinions that don't take too, uh, that don't take too kindly to getting beaten with sticks. Or they don't take too kindly to watching people get beaten with sticks, or getting maced, or set on fire, or having excrement thrown at them. All tactics that Antifa tends to do. And again, don't take my word for it. Really research this stuff yourself. Just go onto any video hosting website. I know YouTube is the most popular. And again, it's only a matter of time before YouTube starts censoring these videos to defend their precious Antifa. But... So if you watch any video that trying to get comfortable, if you watch any video that involves Antifa clashing with counter protesters, something that you might notice again and again and again is that these people are really, really inept at physical violence. They seem to love the idea of physical violence, but they seem to be pretty terrible at it. I recall certain Antifa members saying things like Ooh, I'm going to, you know, they post it on Facebook. I'm going to collect 100 Nazi scalps. It's probably how they imagine themselves saying it in their mind. Now, if you could collect 100 Nazi scalps, I mean, that would actually probably be a good thing. Nazis are assholes. I'm pretty sure that most of the world agreed on this. We agreed on this back in the uh, 1940s. And we've been continuously agreeing on it ever since. Neo-Nazis are exactly where they belong as the butt of a joke and the more or less the fringes of society. Kind of like a kind of like a laughing stock, really. That's that's where they belong. Because you know you're never gonna you're never gonna get rid of all the idiots that think something. You're never gonna get rid of everybody who think who has a dumb idea, and they all tend to gather together because they all agree with each other. You see, that's the point. When an idea is really bad, like bad to the point where it doesn't stand up to any scrutiny, like neo-Nazism, that sort of stuff doesn't stand up to scrutiny, so what they do is that they have to run away from anyone that'll challenge their beliefs and just kind of hang out with people that all think the same, so they can all, you know, spend all day patting each other on the back. Again, the same thing with uh, radical progressives as well. There's enclaves. You should always be able to challenge somebody's ideas, in which case, yeah, if someone, if someone wants to challenge my ideas, absolutely. Because here's the thing. Either they're going to learn something from me, or I'm going to learn something from them. Just a little hidden lesson of the day. But right back to why Antifa is terrible at fighting. I know, we're four minutes in, and there's absolutely no beginning of this insight. Well, now there's. So, Antifa is bad at fighting. I have a theory as to why this is. And the, yeah, free hotel coffee. So, my theory as to why this is, why Antifa is so bad at fighting, it's because what fighting requires, or what being competent in physical violence requires. Now, some people are just naturally gifted at physical violence. You know, they're they're either born very strong, very quick, very big. Mentally, they can be born very vicious. Oftentimes it's oftentimes in a fight it's not it's not who's the biggest, the fastest, the strongest, the quickest, what have you. It's the person that's willing to hit 
the hardest and hit at the hardest spots. It's the person who's willing to keep fighting even when they're hurt. Because most people, when they're hurt, they disengage. You get, every now and again, you get these people that they're hurt, and that just eggs them on even further. They'll continue to fight until they're broken. It's not good. I'll say that much. It's really not good. I know that, uh, I know that frickin', I know kids shows and everything absolutely love to play that up as something that's cool and edgy, but in reality, that's a bad idea. Long-term injuries are not fun. Really not fun. That old song, you, you know, I don't know how many of you listen to country, but, you know, you gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to disengage from a fight that is clearly one-sided. Because, buddy, a spilled beer is really not worth getting a compound fracture over. Can't work out on a broken wrist. Well, you can. I have. It's a bad idea. Doctor called me an idiot. But thankfully everything healed up fine, so... So Antifa's bad at fighting. Now, most people that are naturally physically gifted are not going to join the progressive side. Barring Hollywood actors, because it's a very trendy thing to do, and it also means that Hollywood executives basically tell them to support these causes so that their movies are more marketable. Or so I guess, you know, they might actually believe in that. That's what I'm going to say. It's just there's a pattern I've noticed. Or maybe they just want to conform to the culture. But most naturally physically gifted people are not going to join progressive movements because they're very collectivist. And just by being physically gifted or mentally gifted even, and this doesn't even have to pertain to violence, but typically speaking, being gifted in one way or another kind of kicks you out of a progressive party because you're effectively being told that you're bad or that you are a lesser person or your voice doesn't mean as much because you're not innately disadvantaged. So that's step one. Step one is that most people that are naturally physically gifted are not going to join up with progressive movements or progressive movements like Antifa. Collectivist movements. Let's call them what they are. They're collectivist authoritarian. And so that I'm not, you know, talking on stilted language, basically what that means is that they will heavily enforce their philosophy on others, even at the end of a boot or at the end of a gun. They believe that they have the right to force their ideas on others if they do not agree peaceably, and these ideas are very restrictive to one's lifestyle. Now, collectivists, they care more for the right of a group than the right of the individual is basically what that means. Or they like to judge people collectively. Group identity being paramount, that's what collectivism is. It's a really bad idea. It basically means that all your best people get caught up in group politics, which is a bad idea. It just, it's not efficient as a society. So, there goes all the naturally physically gifted people, just out the window right off the bat. So what you wind up with are the people that are already disadvantaged. Now comes the second thing. I don't know how many people watching this have ever trained or have ever, you know, have ever actually been in a physical confrontation, but two things that most people uh, need to note. Physical confrontations kind of suck. I mean, yeah, there's a nice little adrenaline rush in there, but, you know, getting rocked in the face is not very fun. Generally speaking, not very fun. You know, there's some people that enjoy that kind of thing, but it's really not. So, actually training to get to a certain point, training to get to a certain point where you're actually somewhat proficient at it is in and of itself a task that requires a lot of time, a lot of discipline, and I don't want to call it self-harm, but inflicting pain on oneself to grow stronger is effectively what it is. You spend uh, you spend two hours, you know, you spend two hours punching a bag. You know, you're not going to be feeling good immediately after. Yeah, I mean, there's that nice little exhaustion that comes afterwards, and then there's if you don't stretch and if you don't stretch and recover properly, there's some muscle soreness. But it's a good kind of soreness. But the point is, is that it requires a lot of dedication. It requires a lot of time. It requires a lot of effort. 
and most of these Antifa people do, don't want to actually put that sort of effort forward. They don't want to put the effort forward because they don't believe that they have to. They feel entitled to win when they show up. I think that's one of the reasons that they're so obsessed with the idea of by any means necessary. They're so obsessed with the idea that we're going to do whatever it takes to win, and that's a good thing, because we're on the right side. You know, no, that's not a good thing. You know, there's a reason, there's a reason that whenever we as people organize ourselves, that we have rules of engagement. Even between two people, there's generally a rule, there's generally a pre-agreed upon rules of engagement. Even if it's not stated, it's like a cultural expectation. If you're going to get into a, if you're just going to get into, you know, like a an angry altercation with somebody, there's probably not going to be any biting noses. You're not going to bite anyone's nose off in the middle of the fight. You might throw a couple of punches, someone's going to back off and scream at each other, but that's about it. There's not going to be this is why it's so this is why it's such an outrage when somebody brings a weapon to what should be an unarmed fight because there's an agreed upon standard to which you can actually engage now these antifa people they feel entitled to win but i think on some level they understand that they don't have what it takes to win which is why you wind up with a bike lock guy you know you have that antifa professor just cracking an unsuspecting man over the head with a bike lock and then running away. He felt justified in that because he felt entitled to win because he believed that his side was correct and the other side was villains and therefore literally anything he did was justified. That's not a good idea to bring to the table, particularly when you're already disadvantaged. I'll circle back around to that, but I've got a third point to make about them and it ties in to the second point. So, we've already established that, or at the very least I've thrown my theory out. I'm not going to say we've established, because I'm really not proving anything. This is just me spitballing. But, we've already thrown out the con- we've already tossed up the concept that naturally physically gifted people are not going to show up in Antifa. Okay. So, that's one part of my theory. Second part of my theory is that they lack the discipline to do it because they don't feel like they need to work. And that ties into the third thing. They don't have the humility in order to learn how to properly commit violence. Now, I say commit violence. Violence is not a good act. It's really not. Innately speaking, there is a winner and there is a loser. That is what violence does. It creates a winner and a loser. Which, generally speaking, in most things in life, I think that we can avoid that, and we should absolutely try to avoid that. Like, that is why debate collapses in this country so often. Because everybody thinks that there must be a winner and there must be a loser to every argument. And no, that's actually incorrect. Each person could find a middle ground. They could compromise. They could leave, agree to disagree, and still learn something from their opponent. Most of the time, there is a clear victor when it comes to physical violence. Now, in some cases, two groups can go together, have a punch-up or a wrestle, or, and then part as friends. In fact, that actually happens quite a bit. That happens quite a bit. For the kind of no-holds-barred, we're the ones that are going to be correct, that sort of do-or-die confrontation that they seem to bring to the table, that's not good. It's really not. And when I say they don't have the humility to learn how to properly commit violence, I do mean that because it takes humility to learn. Again, I'm going to assume that some of the people watching have at least trained a little bit, or at least maybe, I don't know, they've heard this from somebody who's trained, but when you go into a training hall or you go into an MMA gym or when you go into a dojo for the people who want to do that sort of thing. Anyways, you go in there, and you are not going to be the toughest guy in the room. You're not going to be the most skilled fighter in the room. You're not even going to be the most half-skilled fighter in the room, probably. You walk in, and you want to start your training. Okay, cool. You want to start your training. Well, first they have to figure out where you are. So they're probably going to put you up against uh, 
you know, mid-level guys sometimes, sometimes they're going to put you up against a high-level guy who's basically learned enough to know how to pull their punches properly. Okay, you are going to learn very fast, unless you are one of those people that trains how to fight every day, and there are these people who train how to fight every day, like eight hours a day, every day. I've met these people. A lot of them are actually very interesting people. A lot of them are very interesting people. Most of them are actually very peaceful people, very reasonable people, and I think that... <clears throat> Sorry, I got something caught in my throat. So anyways, very peaceful people, very reasonable people, and you know, it's, it's very interesting. And yeah, if uh, when you meet them, when you meet them, you shake your hand and it feels like you are basically, you know, grabbing a rock protrusion, and then it's like, okay, I'm about to, uh, I'm about to fight a stone statue that can move faster than myself. Okay, excellent. Let's, let's see how this magical moment turns out for me. So... That happens, and you learn very quickly that unless you are one of these people, unless you have that kind of dedication, uh, you are not the strongest person in the room. And sometimes, you know, if you're, especially if you're young, like a lot of these Antifa people are, like in their late teens, early 20s, that is a bitter, bitter pill to swallow. But unfortunately, it's one that you have to swallow if you wish to learn from somebody, because after that happens... Buddy boy, you are going to have to listen. You're going to have to have... You are going to... You're going to have to lose. And then you are going to have to stay quiet and listen. There is no bragging about yourself to these people. What are you going to... What are you going to brag about? I mean, yeah, I mean, sure. If you are successful in some area of life, you could bring that up. However, that's highly irrelevant if you came there to train. No, no, if you go there to learn at the feet of, if you go there to learn at the feet of an experienced fighter, you go there with a heavy cup of humility, and you got to drink the whole thing. You got to drink the whole thing, you have to show them respect, you have to listen quietly, and then you have to take their advice. And typically speaking, these people, if they, you know, if a trainer, especially a trainer that you're going there to, you know, pay for, if they see that you're eager to learn, if they see that you're not trying to throw your weight around, if they see that you actually are humble enough to learn from them, though, they will teach you. They will teach you. They will help you. And they will also want to know, I've noticed this, every single one of them has asked, why do you want to train here? Why do you want to learn? And that's a very important question to ask. I think that a lot of these Antifa guys, if they were honest, would actually get stopped at the door if they showed up and said, I wish to use violence to enforce my will on others, I think they would actually get stopped at the door there because most people that have taken that long, humble, bitter road to actually being strong enough, actually being strong enough to be considered a fighter, they're humble enough to know that they don't know everything. They don't. They really don't. Because no one knows everything. Even the smartest people on earth. The smartest people on earth will say in full honesty, I know enough to be considered intelligent, but at the end of the day, in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't amount to much. The more you learn, the more you learn that you don't know everything. The more you look at things from other people's perspective, the more you realize the more you realize that everyone has their reasons for doing things. Now, does that mean that everybody is correct and that no one is wrong? Oh, absolutely not. Some people are wrong. Some people have horrible ideas. Like, the idea to declare open and utter warfare on your fellow man for virtually no reason at all other than the fact that you feel that you are right and they are wrong. It's not good. You don't want... When you tell somebody that you will do everything in your power to destroy them, you better have a damn good reason for doing so. Because that sort of that sort of thing, if taken to its full extent, will cause untold suffering, not for just the people involved, but everybody who has to watch it, everybody who is connected to it, and everybody who's going to have to be living with that piece of history ever since you know, ever ever past that moment. However, 
these Antifa people, they don't seem to learn from history. They seem to want to throw that idea around like it's somehow noble or glorious. No, there's nothing glorious in There's nothing glorious about viciously trying to destroy your fellow man. There's nothing glorious about it. It's awful. It's awful for the suffering that you may cause. It's suffering. It's awful for the suffering you might bring upon yourself. And these these Antifa people, they're doing it without any hint of hesitation. They're doing it without any hint that they even thought this through. Because I think that they had it so dug into their minds that there was no way that they could lose. That they were going to win a quick and clean victory and that that would be the end of it, and everything would be good and just after their victory, but clearly they can't even get past the first hurdle. Their arguments were so terrible that everybody just kind of spat them out, and when I say everybody, I say the majority. And then when they came to physically enforce their ideas on people, they were pushed back every time there was resistance. And these Antifa people, they don't fight. They don't fight in a reasonable or dignified manner. I recommend everybody look this up on YouTube. Or anywhere, really, again, anywhere, because everybody has a camera these days, so it's really hard to get away with something. I still don't understand how they don't get that. But no, there you've had Antifa people throwing jars of excrement. You've had Antifa people... Uh, lighting people, uh, anyways, lighting women's hair on fire. You had this one woman who was giving an interview, and an Antifa person walked up and stuck a can of mace in her face, which, by the way, kudos to her, because she immediately shrugged it off and took a swing at the guy. Oh, man, that is... That is proper instincts right there. That is a proper reflex. So... No, you've had uh, you've had three of them gang up on a senior citizen and beat him with shovels. You've had them go after unarmed people when they've had pipes. You've had they are just oh, and then you had that's right the infamous bike lock man who basically snuck up on somebody who was trying to talk to somebody else and cracked him over the head with what is essentially a ball peen hammer and nearly killed him. Again, an unarmed man who was not fighting him, who was also around half his age, and by half his age, I mean the man was in his late 30s and the young boy who got cracked over the head, and I do say boy because he wasn't even a legal adult at that point. Now, thankfully, he is actually facing jail time. But something I realized when I was watching that video, because I did watch that video, the look on his face that smug look of satisfaction and joy. <sighs> Listeners, I've seen, I have thought a lot about the concept of what evil means. I've thought a lot about it, because I think it's a term that gets thrown around far too loosely. And I am not going to even prescribe it to the entire Antifa movement, because that would be unfair, because there are some people in Antifa that are just misguided. But it seems to be attracting people that are deeply, deeply sadistic and malevolent. They seem to extract joy from the suffering of others. They seem to extract pleasure from watching others in pain. And that's why I think that they're horrible at confrontation. Because these are the kind of people that prefer a fight where the other person does not or cannot fight back. Monsters do not prey on the strong. So. That's been, uh, that's been my rant today. Hope you all have a very nice day. Or evening now. Cheers. Mm -hmm.